Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you find yourself today in this great country of ours. Thank you for joining the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast and uh, virtual Western conference. Uh, we'll be starting in approximately one minute. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us. I think my mom from Germany also wanted to join. She was quite excited about this. Well, what time is it in Germany? Uh, seven o'clock at night now. Oh, okay, perfect. All right, we'll begin in just about uh, 30 seconds, everyone. All right, welcome everybody to the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada's Virtual Western Canadian Conference. This is our first webcast of the day. The title of our webcast today is Discovering New Avenues for the Treatment of Acute Myeloid Leukemia. In this webcast, Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer, clinician sci scientist at the Terry Fox Laboratory and Leukemia BMT Program of British Columbia will discuss current research on AML and how this could change treatment in Western Canada. Dr. Kuchenbauer will also share his professional journey as a researcher and hematologist. He's very well spoken, so I hope everyone's looking forward to it. You can go to the next slide, please. This webcast is the first of three sessions offered in today's Western Canadian Blood Cancer Conference. Our second session <clears throat> will be on stem cell transplants where we have two transplant coordinators providing insight into the pathway prior to allogenic stem cell transplants and the road to recovery afterwards. And later this afternoon, we will host our third session, which will include a panel of speakers who share their story of diagnosis, treatment, and recovery, as well as provide personal insight into managing a blood cancer diagnosis. So it's not too late. If you haven't registered for either of those sessions, please join us. Uh, it's a wonder, you know, wonderful thing you can still do from your patio virtually. So if you haven't registered yet and you'd like to, not too late. You can email Desiree Naylor, that's D-E-S-I-R-E-E -E -E dot Naylor, N-A-Y-L-O-R at L-L-S dot org for the registration link. Registration information can also be found on our website. So it's time to introduce myself. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. Uh, my name is Ryan O'Quinn, and I have the honor and privilege to serve the blood cancer community in the capacity of outgoing uh, regional director for the Prairies region and regional director for British Columbia Yukon chapter of the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. I truly consider it a privilege to be in this role and to work with this community. I'll be the host today for this webcast. The presentation will be about 60 minutes, and it'll include a Q&A period at the very end. Since there are many of you, uh, we invite you to type your questions and comments into the Q&A box of your Zoom webinar panel throughout the presentation. Uh, a staff member of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada will monitor the questions. I will read some of your questions aloud at the end of the presentation during the question and answer period. The conference will also be recorded, therefore you can listen to it again on our website. <clears throat> So before we begin our main presentation, I would just like to share a little bit about um, our mission and highlight some resources that might be helpful to you or someone that you know. So we can go to the next slide, please. At the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada, our mission is simple. It's to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life of those touched by a blood cancer and their families. We offer guidance and support every single step of the way. Next slide, please. We know the current situation presents many challenges, and that's an understatement to those that are affected by blood cancer and their families. <clears throat> we have a team of community service managers across Canada that can help you. They're compassionate navigators and connectors that can help those affected by a blood cancer diagnosis 
cope with the anxiety and the isolation that people may be experiencing during these times. I cannot say this and emphasize this enough, please do not hesitate to reach out to this talented team uh, in your area. You can go to the next slide, please. We offer a variety of educational resources and support services to help those affected by blood cancer, including AML. So for example, on our website, bloodcancers.ca, you can access free booklets, fact sheets containing information about specific blood cancers, treatments, and practical information, as well as a new educational video about AML. Next slide, please. So just visit bloodcancers.ca slash webcasts. I'll say it again, bloodcancers.ca slash webcasts to watch the recordings of all of our past webcasts and new announcements for our upcoming webcasts. You can also subscribe and listen to our podcast series, the blood cancer experience uh, to learn more about treatment and research and to hear stories from people affected by blood cancer. Our podcasts are available on Spotify, Apple podcasts, and pretty much anywhere you enjoy listening to your favorite podcasts. Next slide, please. Our peer support program is a support service that matches people affected by your blood cancer, caregivers, their families, and trained volunteers who've been touched firsthand by a blood cancer and shared similar experiences. Whenever possible, participants and these volunteers are matched based on their age, their gender, and their diagnosis, and it can be a useful program these days to counter the effects of isolation. The benefits of this program are numerous, and uh, I've heard firsthand just how powerful uh, the service really is for our people. So uh, we're so excited, we're already on the slide, so I'm ready for it here. So it's my great pleasure to introduce today uh, our speaker, Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer. Dr. Uh, Kuchenbauer moved to Vancouver two years ago to set up a translational research program between the BC Cancer Research Center and the Vancouver General Hospital. His work focuses on non-coding RNAs, leukemia, myeloma models, and drug-related research. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed collaborating with Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer, how well-spoken he is, and just how passionate he is about his work. And Florian, uh, we're all just eternally grateful for what you do. Uh, so thank you for being uh, with us today, and maybe even your mother from Germany, as you mentioned. Uh, Dr. Kuchenbauer, uh, for taking your time on a Saturday, your incredibly busy schedule, to support our community. So with that, I will hand the microphone proverbially over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ryan, for this nice introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to um, speak to the community. And although last time people complained that my accent sounds a little bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I think it makes it a little bit more charming overall. So today I would like to talk a little bit about what is new in the leukemia field, how we do research and why research matters, because that's basically the root of all development for treatments. I am a clinician scientist um, originally from Munich, Germany. And I trained in Germany. I also did a PhD in Vancouver. And my wife and I, we got recruited back um, to just see, this is Amazon, uh, two and a half years ago um, to, to start a translational research program here in Vancouver, combining basically clinic and research. And it's it, sometimes this is very challenging because it's only they're only two blocks away, the hospital and the research um, center. But um, sometimes a block can be really hard to make people communicate. So let me give you a little bit of an update and an insight how this works. So what's really important to see is that AML is still a hard to treat disease. And this is data here, and I'll guide you through this slide, is survival data based on outcome. Um, and this is U from the US. You can see that this is data from the last 17 years. And on the y-axis here, you see percent surviving. So basically 100% is everybody's alive. And these are the years on this, and 50% is only 50% of patients are alive. We can see depending on the age when you develop leukemia, the outcome is very different. So the younger you are, the better the outcome overall. So overall, the if you look at all ages, you see the five-year overall survival is in the US around 25%. In Canada, it's similar. In Germany, it's similar. So it's, so it's between 20 and 30%, which is not a lot, considering that we are sending um, ro robots and, and, and ro rockets to Mars nowadays. But still, acute myeloid leukemia is such a challenge. 
And and this is an interesting and, and this is a, and, and this gives why that is 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 quite interesting. And and I think to to better understand this, you have to go back to the history of acute myeloid leukemia. And the first case report about myeloid leukemia was actually reported in Germany by Rudolf Wilchow, who was a pathologist in Berlin. And he um, called it, and he also said, came up with the name leukemia because leukos is white in, in Greece, in Greek, and um, um, emia is, is blood. And here in German, in this original article, it's called Weisses Blut, which means white blood. And he saw a patient because he was the, one of the first pathologists using actually a microscope. So he saw a patient and looked at the blood of this patient and saw it was virtually white, as you can see here. And, and then the next, and then there was a lot of, um, and this was like in the mid 19th century. And then from there, um, pathology actually developed. And you can see that 100 years later already, the first bone marrow transplantation was done in dogs. And this was done in Seattle. And Seattle is one of the meccas of, of, for bone marrow transplantation in the world, um, was performed. And you can see then in the 70s, um, Janet Rowley was the one who founded modern genetics in, in acute myeloid leukemia, or in leukemia in general, because she discovered the Philadelphia chromosome, which is relevant for CML. She also discovered the 1517 translocation, inversion 16 translocation. So she's, she was very, um, she was the one who guided and, and founded modern genetics and and this is a really interesting fact here that the treatment we are still using seven plus three some of you might have heard of it um, was initially introduced in the 70s and the first clinical trial on this treatment was performed or was published in 1981 we're still using the treatment this is the standard treatment we're still using like 40 years year later can you imagine i mean this this also this already shows like how much or how big there's a that there's a need to develop new treatments and and then the mid 90s this was when when molecular genetics came up and there were better methods like sequencing was introduced to discover what exactly is happening on the molecular level rather than on the chromosomal level and um, and in 2008 timothy lay at the nih was the first researcher to fully sequence an aml genome of an aml patient and and this kind of started a, a huge wave of genetic data on uh, characterizing acute myeloid leukemia and it really helped to stratify and to subclassify acute myeloid leukemia better but actually the, the biggest breakthrough in the last 40 years since 7 plus 3 was in, introduced is that it took so many years to finally approve new drugs and then two, from 2017 to 2020 nine new AML drugs were approved. I mean, this was, is a, it sounds like very little compared to other cancers, like my, in myeloma, the last 15 years, a lot of new drugs have been in, um, uh, approved by the FDA, but in, in AML, suddenly everything came out in the last three years. And I wanna tell you a little bit about these drugs. What's really interesting to see, or like what's important to understand is that acute myeloid leukemia is a disease that when you look at it in, in the microscope, they, all these leukemic cells look pretty similar, but they have an internal hierarchy. And it's a little bit like um, normal hematopoiesis where you have a stem cell, which, which is basically the cell that from, from which all the um, working cells, like the leukemia cells derive, and this is called the leukemia stem cell. And this is the cell that um, eventually is, is responsible for the disease to, to arise. And then you have the leukemia bulk cells. And this is important to, to understand because if you, if you treat somebody and you only kill the leukemia progenitor cells and the leukemic cells, but the leukemic stem cell survives, you, you create a relapse. And, and this is what we have to prevent. So basically from a therapeutic point of view, we have to target these leukemic stem cells to get rid of them. But what are the new avenues for this? So this is a recent um, review article where um, the authors try to summarize what do we have and what can we do for acute myeloid leukemia. And there are a lot of different avenues. And one of the things, or like the first one I want to talk about is venetoclax. And this, was, this is a drug which has initially been developed for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And you can see how promiscuous these drugs are because once you have it in one disease, your companies try it out in every other disease. And initially, first reports on venetoclax were disappointing, but then in combination, it was um, actually, um, it's now becoming standard of care for a lot of patients. So what is venetoclax? 
when you go back and, and think about what are the things that are relevant for cancer, and, and, and we call it the hallmarks, what are the hallmarks of cancer? Um, one of the things that was added to this is our deregulated cellular energetics. So cell energy, basically cell metabolism. This is something that was new and was added in the new and the updated version of hallmarks of cancer in 2011. And, and this is all about the energy metabolism of a cell. And when you maybe go back to your biology um, classes at school, you might remember that there are two ways of creating energy in a cell. One is, one is using oxygen. This is the aerobic one, which is happening in the mitochondria, which you can see here. And the other one is the anaerobic one, which is using lipids and glycose and producing energy. This one is the more efficient one. And this is the main component of the energy metabolism. And you can imagine if you, now stop this energy metabolism and vinyl does this then the motor of the cell is not working and the cell breaks down and this is what um, we want to exploit in, in leukemia cells but how was this found so leukemia stem cells they rely on an oxidative phosphorylation which is also called oxfos in short ways so um, a researcher, his name is Craig Jordan, and he's in the University of Colorado. He, um, he looked at patient samples and he was thinking, hey, is the metabolism relevant for these samples? And I can guide you, it's, it's not so complicated as it looks here. So what he did, he took AML patient samples and then he divided the same sample of a patient, one sample, he divided into cells that have low energy metabolism and high energy metabolism. And the idea was that leukemia stem cells, that they have a very low metabolism because they're hiding in the bones and, and this low metabolism makes them basically, protects them from, um, from chemotherapy. So they're hiding in the bone in a niche. And indeed, when he took these leukemia, like when he sorted these cells into low and high metabol metabolomic cells of a patient and transplanted them into a mouse, he saw that the ones with the low metabolism are the ones that gave rise to leukemia. And once he started profiling these cells, he realized that a certain gene, BCL2, was highly upregulated in these low metabolomic cells. And, and this gene, BCL2, is the target of the drug venetoclax, which is an antagonist for BCL2. And, and then there were, and he conducted a clinical trial and others, and this is a very recent one, which was published in the New England Journal, where the combination of azocytidine plus venetoclax um, gave a much better overall survival in patients who who were um, in patients who were frail or ineligible for intensive chemotherapy. And uh, and this venetoclax standard here is azimuthus venetoclax became a standard for the treatment of AML in in frail people or also in patients who are who are um, who are, for example, not um, who are not responding to classic chemotherapy. So, this is a very recent work where now this drug venetoclax has been shown to be very successful in patients who are, for example, non-responders to classic chemotherapy. So, what's the next thing we do? We combine it with every other chemotherapy we have, and this is a very um, recent publication where venetoclax was combined with a chemotherapy regimen, it's called flag -Ida. It's just a combination of different uh, chemotherapeutica. And uh, what, what it does is, it is something that we use in, especially in relapsed AML. It's a rather aggressive treatment combination. So, and this combination was tested now in newly diagnosed or relapsed or refractory acute myeloid leukemia. And the way it was designed, it's, um, they, you can give it as an induction up to two cycles, and then there's a consolidation up to six cycles. And these patients they can either go to allogenic stem cell transplantation if they achieve a remission, or they go on then maintenance for one year. But only one patient in this trial went on this. So most of them went to allogenic stem cell transplantation. So what are the results? And you can see that, and, and I wanna start on the right-hand side because we always ask for overall survival. You can see that patients, who have newly diagnosed AML. And this is the line up here, the blue line. You see that the survival probability um, was really good. So these patients got it at 
at the beginning of their treatment and you see that 90% are still alive after almost 24 months of um, observation. And patients who had already relapsed and refractory AML, so these are patients, this is a very difficult to treat patient collective because these patients, and some of you might know, have already received multiple lines of treatment. So you can imagine that the leukemia has survived all these lines of treatment. So the clone, the leukemia cells are highly trained to be resistant to treatment. But still 50% of these patients were still alive after 18 or 24 months, which is a, or like it's almost 60% in the study, which is a great result. So, um, and this one here is where they try to find the right dose. So please discard this one here. So this is, these are basically the patients that eventually received the final dose of this drug in this combination. And you can see that this is actually a great outcome. Usually the, these patients have, a, the, the outcome is like, it's like this, is like 20% or so after like a, after a year are still alive. So, so this was really good. And you can see that also the event free survival is, is not too bad, but still patients relapse. So they're not completely disease free after 24 months, especially the newly diagnosed ones here. So another interesting drug, and I think this is a really, really cool approach, which was initially discovered approximately like, like eight, nine years ago, is to target um, a receptor, which is called CD47. I mean, this is, sounds very cryptic, but basically what this drug does, and the drug is called Magrolimab, Magrolimab, so that's, I think, the right way to pronounce it. And this is a drug where, which is still in clinical trials. And in, in, in Vancouver, we are starting a clinical trial, hopefully in fall. Um, it's a phase one trial. But what it does is that um, this is a drug which, or like this receptor, which is the target of this drug, CD47, is a receptor that connects macrophages. And macrophages are the eating cells. So these are the, like, the cleanup cells in the system. So if a cell dies, macrophages come and, uh, come and snatch it away. Or um, if there's a cell, for example, um, like a cancer cell, which in the body tells the macrophages, please kill the cell and eat it up. So, but some cancer cells and, and quite a few leukemia cells actually, they developed a, um, a resistance mechanism. So they are basically putting out a flag which cell tells these macrophages, don't eat me, don't eat me. And this don't eat me signal is CD47. So if you now block this don't eat me signal, so basically you, um, what happens is that macrophages, um, and we call this phagocytosis when they eat a lot, um, kills these um, leukemia cells. And the idea is to combine it with chemotherapy, like isocytidine, for example. And, and what was really amazing in these trials that have been recently shown at conferences is that this monoclonal antibody um, had a very good treatment response of like 60, 70%, especially in patients who had already um, who have high risk cytogenetics like TP53 mutations. So these are patients that have a really bad outcome because they're usually pretty refractory to chemotherapy. And here the responses were really high, especially in combination with azacitidine. And as I said, um, it was 60% in the overall patient population and almost 70% in the TP53 mutant patients. But you can see the N is the number of patients included in this trial was like 43 and 29. So, so this is very little. And, and these are very controlled conditions because these patients have been carefully selected for trial. So it's hopeful, but it really will take a couple more years to bring this actually, um, or to show how, um, how effective this drug is. But I found this a very cool and elegant approach to kill leukemia cells. So you can see that all these approaches are going more and more towards um, chemo-free treatment, not using classic chemotherapy anymore. But which factors are relevant now for treatment outcome? And there are lots of different factors, right? You have like the fitness and age of a patient, access to healthcare is a big thing. So, so if, I mean, it's, it's a financial thing actually, like financial status, can you afford a drug? If a drug is maybe approved in Canada, but not supported by your health um, care system. What is the, is a drug, for example, approved in the US, but still not approved in Canada, then the availability is a, is a problem. So um, the thing I wanna talk about is, um, disease genetics, and of course, research later. So AML is a very, very heterogeneous disease. And what it means is when people say like, I have acute myeloleukemia, or people say Le leukemia most of the time, then it doesn't tell you exactly what kind of disease they have, because 
um, that we, we know that based on all these molecular classifications that AML can be grouped into AML that responds better to treatment. Some patients have a great outcome and they do not need an allogenic stem cell transplantation, but only chemotherapy. And some patients um, have to get a stem cell transplantation. Some patients are in between where we don't know. So really it depends on the subtype how you treat AML. And I always compare it to like car. When people tell you like, I have a car, you still don't know what kind of car it is. You don't know how fast it drives, how many doors it has. Is it a convertible? Convertible? Is it like a standard or automatic gearing system? So all these things you have to you have to figure out. And and when you look at this like this picture of the cars, and if you translate it to AML, you can see that this disease, which is not very frequent, like it's four in a hundred thousand um, people. The occurrence but you can see when you look at genetics and molecular and molecular genetics um, you have a lot of different um, slices of a pie that all look different so for example um, this group here which is usually they have normal cytogenetics but they have very different molecular genetics or this little group here for example has um, just has one special genetic aberration but the, side, the molecular genetics are very different. So you find a lot of different mutations in different patients. So, so you see it's really complicated actually. But one thing I wanna talk about, uh, which I think is also fantastic because I've treated some patients with this drug and which is, I think is a game changer in my mind is um, FLAT3. And this is a mutation. And I remember when, um, when I started my, when I came out of university and started working in the hematology department in, in Munich at the Munich University, hospital and um, flat three this gene is some, was something really big because um it was recent it was found in the 90s and it was found that almost like 30 percent of all aml patients were carrying a mutation in this gene and this told us that this might be relevant and if we can target this gene like and say like hey what is this gene doing and can we interrupt like the signaling the, the function of this gene can we uh, maybe cure patients and the drugs that were developed were called flat three inhibitors and uh, this is flat 3 is a tyro tyrosine kinase. Basically, it's when it, the ligand binds to this um, receptor, what it does, it tells the cell to grow. And it's relevant for, or to differentiate. It's relevant for stem cells, it's relevant for progenitor cells, but it's also relevant in leukemic cells. And when it's mutated, this pathway of growing is constantly turned on. So we have to interrupt it. And one drug which was recently approved in, in the US and in Canada, is, and this is a second generation FLAT3 inhibitor, it's called giltivitinib. And the cool thing about this drug, it's, an, it's a pill, it's an oil drug. So you take three pills a day and, and, and it really works on patients with um, refractory and FLAT3 mutated AML. And this is a trial which was published last year. It's called the Admiral trial. And it's a phase three trial. So they, they looked at randomized basically 370 patients into either chemotherapy or the drug only. And these are patients that were, um, that had already a lot of chemotherapy or relapsed after transplant. And, but it was a requirement that they carry a mutation in this gene. And the endpoints were overall survival or complete remission status um, in this patient group. And you can see that just taking a pill, no chemotherapy in addition, just a pill, um, was much better in overall survival than salvage chemotherapy, which was also which also included FLAG-IDA, the one which I just showed with venetoclax at the beginning. Here you can see this here, and this is the these are hundred percent of patients. This is and this is month, and you can see after like twelve months of this group, which has been highly pretreated, um, forty percent are still alive, whereas with salvage chemotherapy, it's like less than twenty percent. So I think this was was is incredible and just a pill. And I have I currently have um, a few patients on this drug and um, and it for most of them it works really well I have to say and they're just taking a pill they lead a normal life so it's pretty great. So but now what is translational medicine right why do we need this and translational medicine describes the, the gap in scientific advancements and clinical applications so you really have to bring those two things together. And I'll give you a little bit of an idea how, how this works. And, and this is an experience, like this is my own little journey. And I wanna show you a project which we are working on right now, how this project developed um, 
into what we're actually working right now. Where did it come from? And see, this is me here, um, 20 years back. This is, um, yeah, yeah, it's really me, no joke. And um, 20 years back, this is the picture, this is the photo I took to apply for my very first job actually in 2001. And I was starting to work in the, in, at the Uni, Munich University Hospital and started my training as a hematologist. And I decided to interrupt this training after four years and do a PhD here in Vancouver at the um, Terry Fox Laboratory with Dr. Keith Humphreys. And I was working on microRNAs. These are small genes and they were discovered just right before I started my training. And nobody really knew what they were doing in leukemias and I decided to investigate this. And eventually I published a paper um, where we looked at these microRNAs in, in hematopoiesis because we want to figure out which ones are relevant for um, hematopoietic stem cells. So when I published this, I went back to Germany with my, um, at that time, future wife, and we set up a research, a research group at the University of Ulm. And one of our students at that time, Catherine Kroviorts, um, she was working on one of the findings from these papers. And I sent her back to Canada, where she worked with Keith for half a year, and then she barely, she didn't want to come back actually to Germany because she loved Vancouver so much. And uh, she found that one of the microRNAs we found here is actually a tumor suppressor microRNA, and I call it um, XY here, is a tumor suppressor microRNA and delays the onset of AML in mice. And this work, she started, it took her like four or five years to work on this. And then we presented some of her data at a, at a conference, the American Society of Hematology in 2018. And this project, we brought it here back to Canada because it was not complete was then to taken over by Dr. Yang, who is a postdoc in our group. Interestingly, at this conference, we were contacted by a company from the Netherlands by um, Dr. Van der Bosch, Marion. And she said, you know what, Florian, um, this is so interesting. We developed a drug based on this microRNA, and we are currently looking at its um, effects in solid tumors. Do you want to look at this in, in, in leukemia? I said, like, sure. What was it? It's a small word because this Marion, this doctor here, she was a, also a postdoc at the Terry Fox Laboratory with Dr. Ellie Carson. So you see, it's a small world in, in, in the research setting. And now this drug, um, we just had a meeting two days ago. They already started a phase one trial, and this drug was given to the first patients in the Netherlands for solid tumors. But we still don't know how it works in leukemia. So they gave us this drug, and what we're doing right now, we are testing this drug in leukemia, preclinical leukemia models here at the Terry Fox. And if this turns out, we really want to start a phase one trial too, because this is a new um, drug, it's a new class of drugs, and this is really exciting. And this is how we kind of have such a journey from a project started in 2006, um, potentially moving to patients, hopefully if we find a good um, angle in, in maybe 2023 or so. So you see, it takes like at least 15 years to bring these things from an idea to a practical application, it takes time. And the things that you need are um, is money. So we had to get a lot of grants from the government, from from donors, and and we also got a lot of philanthropy support. So people like you. So thank you very much. Without this, it would not have been possible. We have a lot of motivated people. So students, they all work really hard, and we have a great environment because in Vancouver, this is a fantastic research um, campus, and we have pretty much all the resources we need to do all these um, experiments such as a good animal facilities, core facilities for sequencing. We have access to patient samples. I see patients on a regular basis. So I also get an idea what are their needs. And, um, and of course, we do a lot, have a lot of collaborations doing this. So this is not just a single alone standing thing. It's something where this is, this is based on international collaborations. And, and Zoom really made it easier for us to talk to people. So, but how do, how do you approach basic research? So how can we look inside a cell and figure out what is happening in a leukemia cell? And here, this was one of the better times, like 10 years ago when I, um, somebody took a picture while I was doing an experiment here. And one way of doing this to look, what is a gene doing is to exa exaggerate its function. And, and I, I, was, um, I will show, I'll show this one here. So it, to, let's say we have a mouse and we take the bone marrow of a mouse and we take, put in a diet gene. And what we do is we try to exaggerate the function of a diet gene. And there is no diet gene. You know, I made this up, so so just just to let you know. But um, if we and we what we do is we basically make this gene work a thousand times 
compared to what it usually does. So what happens if we overexpress, like exaggerate the function of the gene, the mice love salad and they eat a lot of salad. But the other way is to delete the function of a gene and takes, okay, let's take out the dye gene. What happens if it's not present anymore? It's obvious, mm, the mouse loves fries. So, so this is a very um, kind of a very easy, not easy, but this is like the basis of how we investigate what a gene is doing. And there are different stages of translational research. And the first stage, and this is what I just showed you, is the basic and applied science research, which comprises preclinical and animal studies. And unfortunately, this is, this is always necessary to better understand what is happening. Then we want to move this, and this is what has happened to, the, to our drug company in the Netherlands. They are doing now phase one trials. And phase one trials are the trials where you basically figure out what is the right dose for a patient. And usually this is done in patients who would not have any treatment options who would have been sent home and say like, okay, sorry, we don't have anything anymore. That's why, and these trials are a way of giving them another chance, even though it's not clear and it takes a lot of effort to do these things, but without this, we wouldn't have any new drugs. And then of course, from there, you go to phase two trials to figure out um, um, is, does it have a benefit for patients and what are the side effects? And phase three is then testing it in a bigger cohort basically looking, is it a true benefit? And from phase, based on phase three trials, you, you get then an FDA approval of your government. So, and this is kind of how, this is the typical pathway from translation, um, translation from basic science to human studies. And that's what I'm heavily interested in because I think this is the only way how we can move the field forward. So how many clinical trials do we have in Canada? Um, so in 2020, we had 29 recruiting and planned AML trials in Canada. And you can imagine in, in Germany, which is like the heart of Europe, and all these clinical trials are connected to the Italian, to the Austrian, to the Swiss, to the English um, trial um, registries. So, for example, in Germany, where and, and, and you can imagine that the Germany sits in the middle of Europe, and going to Austria or to France or to the UK or to Switzerland. Is very easy so you can really connect and you can bring patients in switzerland you can put them into a german trial so these these collaborations are very easy in canada it's much diff difficult much more difficult because it's such a large country so british columbia alone is two and a half times the size of of, of germany and it has a small population overall in canada so it's much harder to bring all these things together and of course, um, then the access of trial hospitals is limited. So for example, in British Columbia, only Vancouver General Hospital does all these trials. And well, it's also St. Paul's, but they're all located in Vancouver. So bottom line, if you're sitting in Cornell, it's much harder to get access to a clinical trial and to get, for example, a stem cell transplantation. And, and the, because of the small population, um, you have few Canada-wide trial groups and Canada is also a smaller market for pharma, for the pharma industry, right? US is much bigger because more hospitals, more trials, more patients. And also the health system varies a lot between provinces. In Germany, the health system is, the healthcare system is very clear. So if, if a drug gets approved by the German government, it's available everywhere in every province. Here, it really depends on the funding of the province. So, so we have quite large differences here. This is something I really had to learn when I arrived here. And as I said, like the drug approval and the drug access, um, these are two separate things in Canada. So in summary, AML is a stem cell disease. Overall, it's a very, very heterogeneous disease. So, so you have a lot of different subtypes. The source for treatment and new treatments are clinical trials. So clinical trials are considered as the standard treatment for AML patients. So really every patient in my eyes should go through a clinical trial to test um, new drugs because the backbone of all the, of the standard therapy has been around for 40 years and we really have to improve that. Research is key to find weaknesses of AML cells. So I, I quickly showed you how we approach re, um, research, how long it takes, what are the re resources we need. And most importantly, it's, it's, it's teamwork, right? So, and, and I mean, not only teamwork between researchers, it's teamwork with patients, it's teamwork with um, for example, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, who helps us a lot to, to do research, who also tells us what is required, what are the questions patients ask, right? I see patients, they ask me a lot of questions, I get like an idea, but like the broader audience, this is really great to work here with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society because they support not only patients, but also researchers. 
And overall, it takes a lot of motivated young people. And this is our research group. Um, and they, you know, this is one of the, it's kind of like an extended family for us. And we are very grateful for the support we got from especially the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, from also Janssen, from um, the BC Cancer Foundation, and of course, from a lot of private families who invested and believed in us. And we are trying to return all the um, money and blood, sweat, and tears they put into us um, with good research and trying to improve patient care. And I thank you very much for your um, attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Florian, thank you so much. Uh, every time I get to hear you speak, I, I personally feel like I learn and I really appreciate you sharing this wealth of knowledge and the years it took for you to, to gain your expertise. You're sharing with all of us uh, your insights. It's, it's really incredible. Thank you very much. So oh, it is pleasure. time, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's time for some Q&A. We do have some questions that uh, have been asked. So I've, I've got one here for you, uh, Dr. Kuchenbauer. Um, I'm gonna try to get the name of uh, the drug correct. Is the, the gilteritinib, thank you, pill blocking the production of the FLT3 AML cells and in effect killing it off or is it a maintenance drug that just manages the FLT3 cell production? No, oh, it, it kills them off. It kills them off, okay. Yes, and this is the drug I mentioned in my talk, right? This is the one I, I showed the survival curve. Mm -hmm. And it's, I can only say that like, this drug is a game changer. It's an amazing drug. I would have never thought we're gonna have, we're gonna treat a relapsed ML patient just with a pill. I, I wouldn't, like <laughs> if you would have told me 10 years ago, I would have, still, I would have said I, I, it doesn't happen. Wow. Where will we be in five and 10 years, right? So um, maybe that's that's uh, a good cue up for the next question. Um, how is the research coming along to find a cure? Well, so I think the next 10 years will um, have a lot of, say, um, within the next 10 years, a lot of new drugs will come to the market. I mean, this research has really, picked up um, based on all the genetic profiling. And the, the thing I see is that we will find now more drugs for harder to treat leukemias. That's that's my take on mm. it. So so my own group is, is working on leukemias that are hard to treat and we are trying to find vulnerabilities in these cells. And I think just based on our own small results in this you know big pond of research, which we are, which we are swimming in, I really think um, there's there's a quite a bit of hope on the horizon and I'm quite excited to actually share these results hopefully in the next few years with everybody. Oh, that's incredible. And yeah, and even what you just shared a little earlier on about just the sheer amount of drugs since 2017 that have yes. been approved and come it's, online. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah. And you know, I really think that the, and, and that's something we, we I mean, we, we're talking to a lot of pharmaceutical companies and they all get the same sense that eventually, I think we're gonna treat with leukemia with pills rather than classic chemotherapy. That's where it's going to move to in the next five years. I really believe so. Wow. It's exciting. Well, I look forward to connecting with you uh, over, over time here. So well, we got another question here for you. Um, is my treatment in 2017 induction one, induction two, and consolidation in brackets, allogenic stem cell transplant now considered the way that we used to treat AML? Is it a treatment of the past? No, this is the classic way of, of treatment. So it doesn't have to be two inductions. And um, depending on the center, some centers to, to, to do two, some just one. But the, the way of induction, consolidation, and then like having a stem cell transplantation as kind of consolidation slash maintenance treatment, that's usually the classic way. It's just what will change is what you use for consolidation. What do you use for induction treatment? I mean, this is the big thing, right, which I think will change the choice of drugs. And potentially, if we can do it, like as I said, if things switch to pills, I mean, quality of life will be much better because you can maybe do your treatment as an outpatient treatment. Right. Um, you might have touched on this a little earlier in the Q&A, but this can maybe help with some elaboration. When do you anticipate the new research being done today uh, will be utilized to improve current treatment protocols? It does already, um, and the, the way to do it is that um, is through clinical trials. 
the, the challenge with a clinical trial usually is it takes years to complete it. Right. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you enroll in a clinical trial, usually um, usually you benefit from it. You either get standard treatment or you get standard treatment plus something else, which is the drug of like to be investigated. And uh, I, I really believe that this is the way to go. And this will in, immediately impact on, on patients just to be to have a choice of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Uh, are you still using full body high dose radiation to treat AML prior to a bone marrow transplant? Mm, no, not so much anymore. So um, this is more for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, we usually use um, as a conditioning, as a myeloablative conditioning regimen, you usually, usually use um, busulfan, for example, or other drugs, but not radiation because it was shown there were a couple of publications um, I don't know, six, seven years ago, where they compared the outcome of total body radiation versus um, chemotherapy as conditioning regimen, and it showed that AML cells, um, the radiation doesn't add to it. It only adds toxicity. In acute lymphoblastic leukemia, they are base sensitive to radiation, these cells, so, so the outcomes were better. So that's why we tried to use it almost exclusively in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Gotcha. Thank you. Here's another one for you. What is a normal percentage loss of lung function over time after being in remission from AML for five, 10, 15 years? Um, that's a hard to, I, I don't think I can answer this question because it really depends on the treatment you receive. Right. Um, for example, if you receive an allergenic stem cell transplantation, the outcome is different than just chemotherapy. So um, I don't think I can answer it, but um, what I can tell you is that it totally makes sense to do long-term follow-ups after chemotherapy um, and still see your physician at least um, once per year or so. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, are there any new treatments for seniors who do not qualify for a BMT due to underlying health issues, like heart issues, for example? Yeah, totally. I mean, venetoclax is the, the, the drug of choice in this case. The tricky part in BC is that um, the drug is still not funded. It's approved, but not funded. So, um, so patients have to, to get access to it. We, we usually, we have a deal with the company. So you get um, some, uh, you, you only pay like 80% of the cost for two months, but still there's a lot of money. And, um, but the combination we usually recommend for seniors is azacitidine. That's the drug of choice for seniors in general or for frail patients. And, uh, and in combination with venetoclax. What is kind of cool, venetoclax is a pill, and azacitidine is now we have the option um, to get access to azacitidine as a pill rather than subcutaneous injections. So, in, so we'd, you'll actually only be on a, like a pill, an oral-based treatment, which I think this is kind of cool. Great, thank you so much, doctor. Um, do you have any other final comments or anything, uh, given some of the questions, is there anything you would like to add? Well, I, I really think that, um, one of the, like, as I said, like, I'm very passionate about research because that's what I've been doing half of my life. But, um, I really believe that, and, and I really want to encourage every one who is attending here that, um, listen to talks, be open to research and, uh, and support research, right? As as much because we're all sitting in the same boat. I, I, you know, who knows what's happening tomorrow to each one of us? And everybody wants the best treatment, and this is the only way to thrive and establish it. Great. Um, thanks so much. Can we? Can you flip to the next slide there for me, please? For Absolutely. Me? Thank you so much. Um, th just again, thanks. Oh, we'll go to the next one. Uh, just got through the questions there, and there should be a. There we go. Uh, but yeah, the Dr. Kugenbauer, thanks so much. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Saturday, but we just really appreciate you carving out time. I know how busy you are. I have a, a, a slight insight into your life and not a big one, but the slight insight <laughs> I have, I know it's busy, but I also know how much you, uh, you, you care to share. So thank you. Um, and obviously we would also like to thank Estella's for generously supporting our event today. If you can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, I would like to remind everyone that we are here to help you. We need to really implore this. We are here for you. Do not hesitate to contact the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada should you require more support. You can reach us by email at info at bloodcancers.ca. So again, info at bloodcancers.ca or toll free at 1-833-222-4888. All of this information is available on our website at bloodcancers.ca, but I'll reiterate the number one more time, 1-833-222-4884. Also, just be sure to check our website regularly to watch past webcasts uh, or future dates for upcoming webcasts. So uh, please note that we are going to send out a short survey. We do uh, encourage all of you to fill it out. It really helps us inform uh, how we conduct these, uh, these webcasts and will help us in the future. So please just take a quick moment of your time to do that. Um, it's really valuable for us. If you haven't registered for session two or three today, it is not too late. Uh, again, please contact Desiree. I believe she dropped her uh, information in the in the chat box. But again, just one more time, uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to Desiree, D-E-S-I-R-E-E -E -E dot Naylor, N-A-Y-L-O-R at L-L-S dot org. These sessions this afternoon uh, are allogenic stem cell transplant from referral to follow up. And the second one is life after acute myeloid leukemia, personal stories of hope. And that'll be at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time and 2.30 Mountain Standard Time, respectively. So again, just thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, that's it from us. We'll sign off again. Thank you so much, everyone. And also thank you to those behind the scenes who have helped make our webcast possible Absolutely. today. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. You too.